Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise you to Allah alone We praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear viewers everywhere, welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda. Uh, I would like to begin by reminding you brothers and sisters with our phone numbers. For those who will be interested to call us live tonight, a record is 002-0238-555. Or, uh, 555 or 249 as well as our email address is ask at huda.tv we had a couple of pending questions from the last episode sister Fayrouz from United Arab Emirates she was very concerned about a very serious matter which is listening to the tapes the audio uh, lectures of some of the shiuch who have question marks on them by some governments or some regimes and listen to you who have signed a treaty of falsehood. Uh, this is indeed, as I said, is a very serious uh, question. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what's best and help us to answer the right answer. First of all, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-hikmatu dalatu al-mu'min aynama wajadaha akhadaha. Wisdom and the right knowledge is what Every believer is looking for the last item of a believer. Once you find it, take it. Whether it's been said or found at a believer or an unbeliever, as long as it is the truth and the right thing. Second, I would like to recall here the statement of Al-Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy on him, who was the Imam of uh, al Medina and the most knowledgeable one of his time, when he stood next to the grave of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he made this very famous remark saying كل إنسان يؤخذ منه ويرد عليه إلا صاحب هذا المقام he pointed to the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and said uh, every man's statement is subject to be right or false that we can take his statement or reject it it depends if it is true then we should take it that means every man's statement is not 100% uh, true. Uh, there is no absolute other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or what he revealed to his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So a person may be right, may be wrong. So that's why we have the right to accept or take his view based on uh, whether it's right or wrong. Except one person that is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he was pointing to his grave. So it could be a great imam, but uh, perhaps his view in one mas'ala is very weak. On mas'ala of the, the current times, uh, he chose an odd opinion or a personal ishtihad. So that is rejected. It doesn't mean that we reject everything from him. And we reject his uh, uh, effort in educating the ummah about the seerah, about the akhlaq, the manners, and about the hadith or fiqh or whatever. As long as the person's aqidah is valid and uh, great scholars of the ummah have vouched for the aqidah and the steadfastness and the person is on the straight path, then we should not just neglect and abandon everything the person uh, have authored, or written or said because he made a mistake or committed an error. This is one thing. The second, if that person have signed a treaty of falsehood, then his actions are belying what he said. So we have an opposition stand against that person. But once again, if we have learned from that person something useful in the past, we do not delete it because this is the hikmah which we're looking for. Found it with him or with anybody else, so we take it. 
Um, I have been asked before uh, by some youth that I used to listen to the Sheikh a lot, then I realized that uh, he's wanted or whatever. What am I supposed to do? Everybody knows that it's everybody's right to defend himself. And unless and until he is proven guilty and judged by the Muslim scholars and this person is out of the folds of Islam or guilty, we do not become judgmental. But everybody should be grown up enough and wise enough to know what to take and what to uh, abandon. Unless if he's confused and in this condition, it is best to look for a trustworthy sheikh or tutor. Wallahu ta'ala ala alam. The first phone call today, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abu Abdul Rahman, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. For all your help. Uh, I have one question regarding. Uh, you have answered this question in the past, but I think things have changed a little bit. Uh, it is. It is regarding. Uh, Aro, can you hear me? I can hear you perfect. Yes, it is regarding the the, uh, the X-ray machines that now exist in uh, some of the European airports and in the United States. These mm. X-ray machines, they show the body contour mm. and private parts. Now, this, uh, I know there was a fatwa from a lot of the scholars that it's not allowed to go through these machines, mm. yet this fatwa was uh, uh, established before the new pat-down procedure. Uh, there is a recent pat-down procedure that came about a month ago where it's very invasive and actually the officers in TSA and other airports, they will actually touch your private parts directly. In public or in private, they give you the option. Mm. You can, uh, but I'm not sure how safe it is to go in, uh, in, in, a, in a closed room because uh, somebody may claim anything that you uh, may have tried to assault them or you may have uh, done something wrong. But uh, the new procedure is extremely invasive and I've been through it myself. And I'm beginning to think now that it's actually maybe even better to go through the machines. Uh, on the counter, on the counter argument of this, some of the um, medical field research say that the effect of these machines on the body is not yet fully understood, and there may be some long-term effects from the uh, strong X-ray that uh, that goes through the body. So there is arguments for and arguments against from the health perspective and also from a privacy perspective. Okay. And I'd like to know what your opinion is, uh, given the new invasive procedure. Jazakallah and what we should do. Jazakallah okay. khairan Abu Abdurrahman from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Brother Mahboub from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam, brother. I have uh, actually two questions. One is related to Salah. Uh, it happened to me several times. Uh, I do understand that I have to recite Surah Fatiha behind Imam or listen carefully. Uh, what Imam is reciting, but um, like it happened to me several times. I was not paying attention, and I realized that I wasn't paying attention when actually uh, the Imam uh, was about to going to Ruku. Mm -hmm. I proceed with the Imam uh, during the Ruku, but I want to know if I have to make up that uh, that portion of the Salah because I was not uh, actually paying attention. Okay. And the second question, he actually told me about. Uh, Passing Mikat without uh, having a ram. Um, it happened to me in 1997 where I actually passed Mikat, arrived in Jeddah without a ram, and he told me that uh, I have to uh, uh, pay the penalty. But my question is I actually, uh, that was my one visit, but I actually performed two Umrah, uh, first day and the second day. So do I need to pay two penalty or one penalty should be fine? Okay. Wajazakum Mahub. Thank you so much. Brother Fadil from the United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, Sheikh, for all your programs. Um, Sheikh, I have, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, I want to know the importance of memorizing the Quran. And the second one is that uh, is it correct that the Dalajat in Jannah is equal to the number of verses in the Quran? Mm hmm. Thank you. Okay, Jazakallah khairan. Thank you. Barakallah fikum. Uh, before I take the second pending question from the previous episode, I would like to go through uh, uh, Abu Abdurrahman's question from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia because of its importance. 
about the X-ray machines at uh, uh, some airports in Europe and in the States, obviously, that uh, whenever the passengers go through, it, uh, it uh, captures an image of them in the nude, which is true. And I have uh, seen and read some articles uh, about that. Uh, obviously, in Islam, that is not permissible. It is not permissible to expose your aura or to stand somewhere where your aura body part should be covered entirely before non-mahram and before other than uh, your spouse should be covered throughout the entire time except for a necessity such as if one has to go through an x-ray for uh, his medical. Uh, what we see at the airport is uh, a very clear violation to the human rights and the human dignity and obviously those who are exposed to it most most are Muslims and uh, one would feel uh, ashamed to let his wife or his daughter go through a machine like that in the past if they wanted um, an individual to be searched uh, they would be taken to a private room and uh, if it is a female, they would have a female officer with dignity and respect. But sometimes it is meant to humiliate certain people. You know what I mean. Many Muslims uh, are being humiliated at the airports. And that uh, creates nothing but it generates more and more anger and obviously a uh, tendency to uh, retaliate. So I uh, would like to uh, highly encourage those governments to review these measures and uh, I'm pretty sure that there will be better measures to deal with human beings in a human fashion. For some or most of those people they do not mind uh, walking in the nude but for us as Muslims it's a matter of dignity. It's a matter of respect and modesty so they understand that it hurts us and it hurts our feeling and especially if one is traveling with his mastura or with his wife. The fatwa then in this regard is that uh, you may go through it only when you have to. So you limit your travel plans to necessity. And uh, once again, it pops up the importance of complying with the Sharia ruling concerning traveling alone without a male mahram for a woman, which is not permissible, as we said. This is the opinion of the vast, vast majority of the scholars based on the sound hadith. So it will undergo the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah and keep your duty to Him as much as you can. And also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted for Muslims to consume what is prohibited in cases of necessity. If you are forced by necessity, rahim. So one who has been forced by necessity, he has to. I'm here hinting to those who are planning to spend the Christmas uh, vacation in Europe, they uh, uh, they go to attend parties and they go in the summer to spend the summer vacation. It is not a necessity. It is not necessary to travel to such countries where you know that your aura will be exposed and you will be seeing the aura of others. May Allah guide us towards best. Assalamu alaikum. We have another phone call. Wa alaikum assalam. Fairuz from Oman. How are you? Fine, thank you, sir. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Wa shukrillah. Thank you very much for your show. Barakallahu feek. Thank you for And all the effort you are doing. Jazakallah khayn. Do you have a question? I am really grateful. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, regarding the higher studies, you know, because my daughter, she is uh, back home in India, actually. Mm -hmm. And she is doing a course on architect, actually. And whereas we try here, we didn't find any place which is suitable and to afford it, actually, uh, as far as the money is concerned. Mm -hmm. But I'm a bit worried about and uh, I'm not uh, confident about it and I'm really feeling just uh, guilty that she's all alone over there actually because unfortunately there is nobody there to back up her actually mm -hmm. because my father, mother and my my younger brother and recently my sister, they all died actually. So there is nobody there actually and she's all alone actually. So she's so a college student, is she? Pardon? Is she a college student? 
Yeah, she's a college student, first okay. year architect. And there is no higher education uh, uh, where you live in at? Yeah, in Oman, uh, there are actually a very, very few, but it is very expensive actually. We cannot afford it actually. Okay, so it's expensive yeah. that you cannot afford. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but uh, in my in my co in, uh, in my heart, like I feel a guilty conscious actually that. Okay, I got your question, Fairuz. Inshallah, yeah. I'll answer you. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Uh, Brother Abdul Malik from Cairo, Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Abdul Malik. Assalamu Sheikh, how are you doing? Great, alhamdulillah. How about yourself? Alhamdulillah. Right. I'm not too sure if I asked this question before, but uh, I just wanted to find out if I'm having a female companion, so to say, in inverted commas, who we're planning to get married. Uh, but she's Christian. I'm a reverted Muslim, and she, she, according to her, she, you know, after speaking to her about Islam and, you know, believing in one God and disregarding the Trinity, and now finally she's saying she believes in one God and Isa is the message of Allah, and now she claims to have repented. So, now from my point of view or from my I stand, how exactly do I? Like, you know, what exactly about her that she has to do for me to be convinced that she has repented and she is uh, being a practicing Christian, as she claims. Okay, she you, mean, you mean repent, uh, repent from adultery? Yeah, repent from okay. adultery. Okay, and you're concerned about marrying her yourself? That's correct. Okay, okay, sure, I'll answer you, inshallah. Brother Muhammad from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Sheikh uh, Salah, uh, my children are doing his uh, and uh, I want to know what what is the best way to encourage them to continue with this and make it easier for them. And uh, the, my second question is, uh, uh, what, what are the acts which take uh, away barka from uh, our earnings? Because uh, I have been reciting a few duas and uh, trying to practice uh, all those things which increase uh, the barakah and uh, we keep our earnings uh, lawful. But then things come up and uh, which are totally uh, with, uh, in uh, not my, my control. So w what are the things which take away barakah from one? Okay. Jazakallah khairan. Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Sister Aisha from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Aisha. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. How are you? Great, alhamdulillah. Okay. Sheikh, uh, it's like I went to look for cream. All the creams, they sell body cream. It's like they have alcohol, two types. So I want to ask, can I rub it and pray? Is it permissible? Body cream. Yes. Okay. Lotion, body cream, all they have alcohol okay okay that's my question thank you thank you Asha okay uh, brother Mahboub from United Arab Emirates uh, was asking about his Umrah in 1997 and I guess we did answer him he did not uh, uh, assume the intention of Ihram from the Miqat he only made the Ihram when he reached uh, Jeddah so he said that you still uh, owe a compensation for that. The fidya, which is Uslar al Rashib, to be distributed upon the poor resident of Mecca. And he said that next day to my Umrah, I performed another Umrah. So for not passing by the Miqat, for not making the intention of Haram at the Miqat at the first time, would that affect my second Umrah? Do I have to offer two fidyas? No. Because you enter into the sacred place of Mecca with the intention of Ihram for either Umrah or Hajj once. Then once you're in, if you intend to perform Umrah, you have to go to the nearest hell. For instance, Masjid Aisha, or if you go to Medina, coming back from uh, uh, Abiyar Ali, or any of the borders of the Haram. It's not just one point, but these are the, this is the most famous point, the, the point where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha awdaha stepped out in order to make an intention to perform Umrah. Then she entered Mecca with the ihram for Umrah. So now if you are in Mecca 
and you compensated the mistake that you made for the first Umrah, you do not owe another fidya for the second Umrah because it was done fine uh, simply by just going out the haram to anywhere in the hell and coming back with a new intention that would be sufficient for you insha'Allah. Brother Hafiz from the United Arab Emirates uh, asked about the importance of memorizing the Quran and whether the number of levels uh, or the ranks of heaven are equivalent to the number of verses of the Quran or not. Yes, there is a hadith and there is an indication that the number of the ranks of uh, or in Al-Jannah are equivalent to the number of verses of the Quran. And uh, that's why in the hadith which said it will be said to Qari al-Quran in Jannah, Iqra' wa rattil wa rtaqi, recite and recite beautifully and elevate. Elevate and keep upgrading. فَإِنَّ مَنْزِلَتَكَ عِنْدَ آخِرِ آيَةٍ كُنْتَ تَقْرَأُهَا فِي الدُّنْيَا Because your rank will be at the last verse that you recited in the dunya. Uh, some of the scholars say that is pertaining those who memorize the Qur'an or a portion of the Qur'an. Their, their rank will be according to how many verses they have memorized in the Qur'an. My Shaykh, my eminent Shaykh, may Allah preserve him and bless him. I heard from him personally saying that uh, this is limiting something that is already spacious because the hadith did not say about just mere memorization. One who recited the Quran frequently and who had the habit of khatmul Quran every once in a while would be also granted this honor inshallah because not everybody can memorize the Quran. But indeed there is a great honor for memorizing the Quran and that honor comes along with big responsibility which is trying to maintain what you have memorized. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ta'ahadu al-Qur'ana, you have to look after and keep up with what you have memorized of the Qur'an because it can uh, get forgotten faster than a camel or a she camel that uh, got lost and on the run. It will run away if the person does not follow up with it on a regular basis, which we call it revising or al muraja uh, there are some other hadith, of course, in this regard. They are not highly authentic, such as on the Day of Judgment, that the person who memorized the Qur'an, his parents will be worn the, uh, uh, the taj of the honor, the taj or the crown of honor on the Day of Judgment, as a result of making their son memorize the Qur'an. Uh, not to forget that for me reading the Qur'an, for every letter we recite, we receive 10 good deeds. And Al-Hasanatu bi'ashri amthaliha ila sab'imi'ati da'af. So one good deed will be rewarded for 10, up to 700, up to ad'afin kathira, up to unlimited. So one who memorized the Qur'an had to read several times in order to memorize. Had to have a daily sabaq and routine. In addition to sparing daily time in order to memorize and revise. So that person will be exposed much greater time to the recitation and the reading of the Quran more than others. What will facilitate this process? Number one is sincerity. Number two is to abandon sins and ma'asi as much as you can, particularly lowering your gaze from looking at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited Al Imam al Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on him, once had a problem with the memorization. While he was known that he was genius, uh, he was unprecedented in the power of memorizing to the extent that they used to teach us when we were studying at school that Imam al Shafi'i uh, was like a, 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 a photocopier. If he was reading in a book that he had to cover, the other page, less that he will memorize it. So once he failed to memorize something, and he complained to his teacher Waqi'ah, and said, Shakawtu ila Waqi'in, or Waqi'ah su ahivzi, fa'arshadani ila tark al-ma'asi, wa akhbarani bi anna al-ilma nurun, wa nurullahi la yuhda li'asi. So his sheikh advised him that, apparently you have a problem because you've committed a sin. That al-ilm is light. And in order to obtain this light and have it shine in your heart, you have to make sure that you stay away from sins. Wallahu ta'ala a'la a'lam.
another phone call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Ahmed from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Ahmed. Wa alaikum assalam. I, I want to ask you. Hello? I hear you. Yes. I want to ask you, if, uh, maybe nobody asked you, can you prove me? Can you? The Quran, can you prove me that Allah is Rahman or Rahim? Just like in mathematics, two is greater than one. Hmm. That Allah is Rahman or Rahim. I can do that right now and before you hang up. Hello? You, well, you call him from Saudi Arabia, right? Yes. Okay. Have you prayed Isha yet? Sorry? Have you prayed Isha yet? Isha yes, namaz? I prayed. Okay. Yes. How many people around you have not prayed Isha yet? I have no idea. Many, right? I have no idea. Let's talk about non-Muslims. Those who do not pray at all. Right? Talk about disbelievers who every day instead of saying thank you Allah, they bow down to idols or worship uh, other human beings or whatever. Right? Uh, no, so it, being a Muslim, we know that Allah is Rahman or Rahim. I read you. I'm going to prove yes. to you that he is a Rahman or Rahim. Yes, being a Muslim, we know. But for non-Muslim, how we can believe that Allah is Rahman or Rahim? He has a and question only, and I'm, only, I'm giving you the answer. The, yes, only on the base of Quran. Okay, right now, logically speaking, uh, pay attention to this. Those who deny the existence of Allah, the Almighty, completely, or those who worship other than Allah, or others along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't you think that Allah, if, if Allah is not merciful, He would have wiped them out of the face of the earth, and it was... And it would be his right, right or wrong. Yes, it would be his right that he's provided them, he granted them life, he sustained for them their lives, and he provides them uh, regularly, and they thank other than him, and they worship other than him. But he did not destroy them. He did not, he did not kill them. He's given them a respite because of his rahmah. This rahmah, this Rahmah, those who are living in this life will enjoy it as long as they are living. Until they yeah. die, then only the believers will be eligible for his Rahmah. Yes. Sheikh, I will interrupt you. Hello? Go ahead. Yes. I, I have an answer I will give you. Maybe a lot of people are listening. Because Allah says in Quran, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Maliki Yomidin Arahman Rahim. Am I right or wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Why? You need to rearrange Why am I wrong? You need to rearrange it. Rearrange it. So there there is a logic. There is a reason. Allah says in Quran before Maliki Yomidin Arahman Rahim. Allah did not say Maliki Yomidin Arahman Rahim. So this is the proof that Allah is Rahman or Rahim before Maliki Yomidin. Correct. If Allah is, so Allah, if Allah is not Rahman or Rahim, He will say after Maliki Yomidi. Okay. You understand my point? No, no, Ahmed. I want to yes. tell you one thing. This area which you're indulging in is the area of the Mufassirin. And it is not for any person simply to say, why this ayah came before this ayah. Allah said He is Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And this is, these are two traits of His most beautiful names and attributes and traits. Right? So we believe in it. The Quran was revealed in its order. For me to say why this ayah did not come before this ayah, it is not up to me. Uh, Abu Bakr, may Allah, have, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Bakr Siddiq used to witness the Quran's revelation. Fish said, Who am I to give my personal analysis or interpretation of the Quran? Furthermore, he said, Where can I find a sky or heaven to cover me? and on earth to bear me and shelter me, if I ever dare to say in the Qur'an, by my opinion, or interpret the Qur'an according to my opinion. For us, as you said, as believers, as Muslims, we do believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. And the Mufassirin spend tremendous amount 
an effort to explain the difference between the two, two, two scales from a linguistic origin. Ar-Rahman, Fa'lan, Ar-Rahim, Fa'il, and the linguistic difference between both of them, which we explain repeatedly in the program of correct recitation and many other colleagues. But now, you ask him whether he is Ar-Rahman or Rahim or not. Yes, he is, of course, whether believers or non-believers. That's a fact because he's giving them a respite for those, even for us, for Muslims. In, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the weak hadith, the person who worshipped Allah for 500 years, and when he, uh, when he died, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to his angels, take him uh, to heaven by my mercy. He said, no, by my good deeds, because I worshipped you for so many years, I did not commit a single sin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, but by my mercy. When there was an argument, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the angels to weigh his good deeds for so many years versus one nama, one gift that Allah bestowed upon him and upon us, which is the nama of being able to see the sight. And the sight nama outweighed the ibadah and the gratitude that he gave over 500 years. So he's a Rahman because we do not worship him enough, we do not thank him enough, yes, but yet. He is merciful with us. He's sustaining for us. He's maintaining our life and he is answering our dua. There's no question about it. Jazakallahu khayran, uh, Ahmed. Brother Abdul Wajid from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Abdul Wajid. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah. Sheikh, I have uh, three questions. Recent of your programs, you had said uh, making dua in sujood. After the Salah is forbidden and it can be done during the uh, Salah itself. Mm -hmm. Be it Farz, be it Sunnah, be it Nafil. Mm -hmm. Now, this Salah should be in Arabic. And I am an Indian, I am an non Arab. How am I supposed to do it? Uh, ya Abdul Wajid, who yeah. told you that the Dua must be done in Arabic? Salah is in Arabic, right? Correct. So I can mix my language with Arabic in during the Salah? So the question should be this way. Is it permissible for me to say my dua and communicate with Allah in my own language if I do not know Arabic? And the answer is yes. What is required in the Salah is to recite the Quran and the Takbirat and the prescribed supplications and the Dood Sharif in the language it was revealed. But somebody wants to pray for his wife who's given birth, or for his diseased mother, or for deceased father, or for whatever. In his or her sujood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, uh, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدْ I don't know Arabic. Does it mean that I'm not supposed to make dua? Of course not. You may invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your own language. This is one thing. The second, it is not permissible to make an independent sujood or prostration for dua. This is a tradition that's common in some parts of the world. And that sujood is ibadah. It is not prescribed, so it is not permissible. al asdu fil ibadati al mana. We cannot initiate an act of worship because we like it or we want to do it. There is sujood al shukr that once you receive a gift from Allah or you receive from a harm or a calamity, you bow down in prostration, that is permissible. And there is sujood tilawa upon listening while reciting or listening to a verse of sujood in 15 or 16, according to different opinion, verses and positions in the Quran, you make sujood upon, you recite those verses. Besides that, there is nothing called sujood ad dua in order just to make dua. Wallahu ta'ala, a'la wa a'lam. Uh, Umm Ruqayya, Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister Umm Ruqayya. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shaykh, please, I have two questions. Please go ahead. Uh, the first one. I happen to have performed Umrah, and uh, Mikat is, uh, we'll pass it while we're still on the plane, before arriving Jeddah. My intention was, uh, when we get to Jeddah, 
we will fly to Medina, but unfortunately, we are not able to uh, to meet up. Uh, so what we did was um, at the aircraft, they announced that we passed Jeddah. That we passed Almikad. Sorry. So I quickly tied an intention in my mind, but meanwhile, nothing the hope that I will be able to fly to Medina. So when we arrived Jeddah, they said uh, there was no flight to to Jeddah that we have to go to. There was no flight to Medina that we have to go to Mecca. So we 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 are asked to assume Ihram at Jeddah Airport. Mm. I don't know what's my position here. Do I have to pay a fee there for not doing it the prop, uh, the proper way? Let me just or with uh, my that I that I that I made that I assumed during the flight. Will it, be, will it be sufficient? Amur um, let me repeat your question in order to make sure it is, uh, it's as right that you're going for Amr, but your plan was to go to Medina first? First, yes. First. So you're not planning to go to Mecca first. Then when you did not find a ride or a plane to take you to Medina, in Jeddah you made an ihram or intention of ihram to perform Umrah. Am I right? Yes. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah, after the break, brothers and sisters. We'll go for a short break, and inshallah, we'll return so soon, so stay tuned. <laughs> inshallah, on the straight path, we would like to discuss the niqab from an Islamic and social political perspective. So sometimes some non-Muslims, they might not understand the full Islamic pictures. Anyone can say anything about it. Yes. So when can we, who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. This is the biggest question. <laughs> who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. No, they are not sinning. They are not sinning, but we are talking about now the general ruling. Mm -hmm. They are not sinning, but they are going against what has been established it is his own ishtihad at a specific time people would see it as a um, threat a threat exactly mm -hmm. how do we how do we explain to them it's not really a threat it's, it's actually good for the country as well but if we don't participate how would we ever reach to our rights can you clarify with us what should be the level of political participation of the muslims in the west yeah <gasps> Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Amar in the program Back to the Prophet, wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted, so much so that Quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ. Covering the manners in Islam that a Muslim is supposed to have in Islam. There is a strong link between having good manners and piety. And then he said, I guarantee a dwelling in the highest rank of Jannah for the one who perfects his manner. That indeed, truthfulness leads to piety, to righteousness. And righteousness and piety leads to Jannah. Uh, the Prophet used to always uh, maintain family ties. Gentleness in Islam means to treat people with kindness and with tenderness.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, one of the questions that I had in the last episode, um, which is concerning a hadith, Sister Afia from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia inquired about a hadith and its meaning. She said that uh, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that uh, once uh, the Prophet ﷺ heard a man asking Allah for forgiveness or protection against tribulation and affliction. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you have asked Allah for a disaster. Behold, you should rather beseech Allah or him for safety and health. Uh, first of all, the hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ heard a man was asking Allah for tamam al ni'mah for the perfect favor. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, do you know what tamam al ni'mah is? He said, yes, to enter heaven and to be saved from fire. Then he heard another saying that, oh Allah, give me patience, or asking Allah for sabr. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you, just have, you, you have just asked Allah for tribulation. Because when you ask him for patience, that means you ask him to uh, afflict you or to try you, uh, and to try your patience, uh, and so on. Yet, this hadith is a, is a weak hadith. Uh, so that's why I will not go through it. I quoted the hadith and I corrected the, uh, the part which says that the man asked Allah for forgiveness. No, he did not. In the weak hadith, he said, he asked Allah for a sabr. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you just ask him to afflict you or to try you. Rather, you should ask him, Allah, al-'afiyah. And rather we have in the sound a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to ask him, to ask Allah for pardon, for uh, health and uh, uh, to be safe and sound. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-'afwa wal-'afiyata fi dunya wal-akhira. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-'afwa wal-'afiyata fi dinina wa dunyana wa ahlina wa malina. The perfect dua is to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for al-'afiyah, to be pardoned to be safe and sound, to be in healthy condition. So Al-Afiyah is one of the greatest uh, ni'am and gifts. And this is what we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Similarly, when a person was sick and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi visited him and the person was severely ill, the, uh, the, the hadith said that he looked like kal like the little chick. The man, the grown-up man became like a little chick and he was so sick. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, do you ever make dua? He said, yes. He said, what do you say in your dua? He said, I say, oh Allah, if you're going to punish me in the hereafter, so bring it on right now, not to be punished in the hereafter. At that, the Prophet ﷺ was angry with him and said, Innaka la tastati'u. You cannot afford uh, such thing to be tested or punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, neither in this life nor in the hereafter. Rather, you should ask Allah al So we should really, in the morning and in the evening, recite this dua to ask Allah or al fi dunya wal in our health, in our wealth, in our family members. Wallahu ta'ala a'la a'lam. Her husband also denies her rights and prefers his parents and family over her and does not respect her in front of his family. Unfortunately, this is a typical question, especially if the wife is living with her in-laws in the same house, it is not advised. It is the right of the wife from the beginning to have an independent housing. And when she agrees to live with his parents or with in-laws, it creates a lot of problems. It does create a lot of problems, especially if she's also living with her brother-in-law and sister-in-law and their children and so on. This is a cultural uh, dilemma that we see it in many, many families. Uh, we remind both the husband and the wife that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, For them, for women, for the, the wives, they do have rights exactly similar to those which are due upon them towards their husband. So there is nothing called that the husband's rights without the wife's rights. That's not fair. The Quran is stated that there are equal rights, mutual rights, and both have to, res to be respected and uh, paid on full. Uh, as far as the private relationship or issue between the sister and her laws and so on, it cannot be determined based on one side story. 
many times when we counsel such families, we realize that uh, maybe the person who's complaining is actually at, uh, uh, at fault or the shortcoming is coming from him or her. I'm not particularly pointing to a sister, but I'm saying this is the case. Uh, honoring your parents in law and taking care of them and looking after them would raise your ranks before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you furthermore. And that will develop and increase the love to you in your husband's hearts. But if the case is very, very problematic, then you need to have a family counseling. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Brother Fairuz from Oman, I could uh, feel you, brother, when you said that you have to send your daughter abroad uh, to live by herself. No one around to look after her and you're extremely worried because you cannot afford send her, sending her to a local school where you're working or living. إِلَى اللَّهِ الْمُشْتَكَةِ We only complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that Muslims treat each other unfairly. Uh, we should look after our Muslim brothers and sisters, especially those who left their countries and came to work for us. Facilitate for them to bring their spouses. It is not possible for a man to stay away from his wife for so long. I'm not talking about six months like the maximum period that Umar ibn Khattab uh, sat, or a year or two. Some people who work in, in some of the Muslim countries would never have the right to bring their wives to the country, their spouses, their children. So they would uh, be living separated from them for so long in order to provide for them to put just bread on the table. That is not fair. Wallahi, that's not fair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never pleased with them. And he's very upset and angry with those who treat their fellow Muslims as slaves. Another thing which is, I hope inshallah our uh, leaders and our uh, uh, diplomats would look into that, which is when somebody has been living in a country for a decade or two and working and serving this country for so long, and now his son or daughter, particularly the girls, reached uh, the college um, education. We have to find a solution for them. Or at least that if you've been living in the country for so long, they give them a break, 50%, 70%, and it won't hurt. We throw money right and left. On what? On nonsense. So why not honor our Muslim families, and Muslim brothers and sisters who are supporting our economy? I'm speaking, generally speaking. If that person was living in the States or in Canada, they would do, they will have some rights, especially after staying for so long. Now, I would like to answer your question, Brother Fairuz. If it was my daughter, I would never send her abroad to get an education, even if she does not get this education, the higher education, because the alternative is there. Alhamdulillah, shukrillah, she can get the degree online, and that is available. She can even sign up with a college whether you say that Islamic studies, it's all available online. And she can get a BA at the convenience of her house without having to go anywhere. If she wants to study any other uh, other, in any other field, there are American universities online as well. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you and everybody who is in your situation and uh, reunion you with your family members. Amen. Abdul Malik who keeps asking about the girl that, whom he wants to marry and she repented. It is not me who decides whether she repented or not. I said before, I, I don't really care whether she's Christian or not. What I care about if she is muhsana. So if she is muhsana, brother Abdul Malik, if she is modest, if she's chaste, and she repented and it's been a while like that, she does not establish relationship with uh, uh, men outside marriage, then it is permissible for the person uh, to marry her. Yet, I advise you to look for a Muslim uh, woman to marry in order to be the mother of your children. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. And until next episode, I leave you in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته
mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest.